God who creates, redeems, and sanctifies. Amen. I invite you to be seated. Um, please do know that my sermon today will be addressing war and violence. So if anyone would like to take a break for a bit or give your kids a break, uh, it will be about 10 or so minutes. So we do have Sunday school going on right now, a wonderful lesson. I'd like to drop by. As Christ breaks bread and bids us share, each proud vision ends. The love that made it, the love that made us, makes us one, and strangers now are friends. From our stewardship hymn, uh, I come with joy. Amidst all the troubles in the world, from violent conflict in the Holy Land to government dysfunction in Washington. This particular verse of our parish stewardship hymn that we're seeing this season seems particularly timely. If only we can learn to share. Our divisions would be healed and ended, and strangers would be friends. Instead, this week saw an escalation of the conflict between Israel and Gaza control, sorry, Hamas controlled Gaza with millions of civilians caught in the crossfire. Among the dead are hundreds of people who are taking shelter in the courtyard of the al ahi Arab Hospital, a working medical facility that is the only Christian hospital in Gaza, and it's actually owned and operated by the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem, our Anglican counterpart in the Middle East. Others were killed later in the week as they took refuge in the Greek Orthodox Church of St. Porphyrius, Gaza's oldest active church, when it was long. The conflict has even spread around the globe as Jews and Muslims and those who might appear to be Arab, Muslim, or Jewish have found themselves the targets of violence or hateful speech. In a particularly horrific incident near Chicago, six-year-old Palestinian-American boy, Wadea al fayumi was murdered in a hate crime for being Muslim. His mother, Hanan Shaheen, was also wounded. When their attacker confronted them and said he was angry about what was going on in the Middle East, Hanan, the boy's mother, said to the attacker before the attack, let's pray for peace then. Let's pray for peace. If only around the world, everyone would stop for just a few minutes and do just that. Imagine what a difference that would make. Now, I want to be absolutely clear that I condemn the barbaric Hamas attack against Israel, in which innocent civilians, young and old alike, were brutally murdered. It was not a brave act of resistance, as some have suggested. Instead, it was evil. The perpetrators of the attack should be bound and held to justice, held accountable for their crimes. I also want to be absolutely clear that while Israel has the right to defend itself, its citizens, its military response has not been proportionate. In fact, has been completely out of proportion. In attempting to crush the militants behind the attacks, the Israeli government has itself terrorized the population of Gaza, killing thousands of civilians in airstrikes, forcing hundreds of thousands of people to flee their homes, and shutting off water and power in an already desperate humanitarian crisis. I am 100% in support of the right of my Jewish siblings in Israel and around the world to live in peace, safety, freedom, and security. But I am also 100% in support of Palestinians' right to the same thing. Why? Why do we have to choose between people, choose between human beings? Of course, it's complicated. There is a long history that predates and it has led up to the current crisis. There is a great deal of hurt on all sides. The land is contested, 
and the world powers made things worse over and over and over again. In its short history as a nation, Israel has found itself often isolated, surrounded by hostile neighbors, and so it became a fortress. Many Palestinians who had their homes taken from them unfortunately turned to violence. And Israel understandably developed a siege mentality against the threat of terrorism from within and war without. Unfortunately, in attempts to protect civilians, successive Israeli governments have persecuted ordinary, nonviolent Palestinians. And the current government, in order to maintain its grip on power, caters to the most extreme religious parties who seek to colonize Palestinian land and marginalize the place of all non-Orthodox people in Israeli society, whether Palestinian, secular, or religious Jews of different backgrounds. Support for the Jewish people of the world in the face of anti-Semitism does not require support for the current government of Israel. In fact, many Jewish people inside Israel and around the globe support the cause of Palestinian liberation and criticize the discriminatory policies of the Israeli government. But unfortunately, there is rising anti-Jewish sentiments around the globe so much that some have actually cheered the Hamas attacks. Others have become apologists for terrorism. And in the face of this, many progressive Jewish people feel alienated by people they thought were their allies. And so we, as the church, as Christians, need to let them know that we are still their friends, even as we also build bridges of friendship with Palestinians. On the other hand, as I read statements of strong support for Israel, and also Jewish constituents and friends, public officials, and religious leaders here in the United States, I've noticed that all too often there is a deafening silence when it comes to the current sufferings of the Palestinian people. We can be in solidarity with both the Jewish people of Israel and the world and the Palestinian people. We don't have to choose between Israel and Palestine. We don't have to choose between human beings. We do have to choose between peace and violence. We can be opposed to the terrorism of Hamas and the brutality of the Israeli government's military response. We can call our leaders to support targeted, precise interventions without leaving the entire population of Gaza in a rapidly deteriorating humanitarian crisis. The cycle of violence must end. Continued persecution only breeds more desperation, which breeds more radicalism and violence. If we want to truly put an end to Hamas and other terrorist organizations around the world, then we as a global community should actually be investing in building up these communities that have turned to terrorists out of despair because of the poverty and injustice that they face. But with so much suffering and so much complicated international geopolitical concerns at play, some might ask, what can we do we here at this little church in this little city, what can we do right now? Can we do anything? And the answer is absolutely yes, we can do something. First, we can speak up and listen in solidarity with all of our Jewish, Muslim, Palestinian, and Arab friends and neighbors. We can ask them how they're doing right now. And we can let them know that we're here for them. We know that right now they might be facing some ignorance or hateful comments. And a kind word of encouragement or listening ear can really make a difference. Second, 
We can get it. I invite you to consider joining me in donating to our fellow Anglican Church's relief work through the American Friends of the Episcopal Diocese of Jerusalem or through our own Episcopal Relief and Development. Third, we can advocate. I invite you to consider joining me in taking action today by demanding that our elected leaders call for an immediate ceasefire, increased access for humanitarian aid, restoration of water and power in Gaza, and the release of hostages held by Hamas. The Episcopal Church joins other faith communities, including Jewish and Muslim organizations, in this urgent advocacy. You can contact Congress today through the Episcopal Policy Network on your own or after church through the resources we'll have available in the back with uh, Pastor Catherine and with Derek. Fourth, we can pray. And prayer is really important. It's not just an add-on to these other things. It's not just something nice we say. It is the heart of what we do as people of faith. Prayer reaches out with its invisible tendrils of energy, like a warm embrace to those for whom we are praying. And prayer also changes us and transforms us, our minds and our hearts, as we pray. And so today, I hope you will join me in prayer for all the people of Palestine and Israel, for an end of current violence, and for a lasting and just peace. And so, right now, at this moment, I want to lead us in a prayer. It's from the Episcopal Public Policy Network, and you can find the bulletin insert to take with you today. Let us pray. O oh God of all justice and peace, we cry out to you in the midst of the pain and trauma of violence and fear which prevails in the Holy Land. Be with those who need you in these days of suffering. We pray for people of all faiths, Jews, Muslims, and Christians, and for all people of the land. We pray to you, O Lord, for an end to violence and the establishment of peace, and we call for you to bring justice and equity to the peoples. Guide us into your kingdom, where all the people are treated with dignity and honor as your children. For to all of us, you are our heavenly parent. Amen. And after we pray, one final thing we can do is we can share our lives and our joys. We cannot let all the hate and violence and negativity be the last word. Instead, we need to live our lives as a testimony to the hope that is within us. The hope that is within us as a people of faith, as a people of peace, as a people of love. And we here at Trinity are a community of love. And we are called to share that love with one another here in the church and outside the walls with the whole world. And that begins right here today in this very liturgy, this service that we are here to celebrate with one another. It begins here. This Sunday, we celebrate the love of God and the baptism of one of our parish children, Keegan. And we also celebrate 10 years of marriage equality in New Jersey, which has helped us to see God's love more clearly through devoted relationships between people of all genders. In baptism, this thing that we do today, we choose the liberation that comes from the path of love. And in our baptismal covenant, we vow to seek and serve Christ in all persons, loving our neighbor as ourselves, and also to strive for justice and peace among all people, respecting the dignity of every human being. Our church's advocacy for marriage equality and our celebration of it here today is an expression of those vows. And so may we bring that spirit of love and liberation to all we do.
Now, I grew up um, a child of the 80s and 90s, listening to songs of liberation, uh, the 1960s social protest songs. And one of my favorites is by a rock band called The Guess Who. Its chorus goes, maybe I'll be there to shake your hand. Maybe I'll be there to share the land that they'll be giving away when we all live together. It seems like a simple vision. Maybe perhaps sometimes it seems a little bit naive. But what a beautiful idea to share the land, to live together, to extend a hand of friendship. It's a vision, instead of scarcity and abundance, it's a vision of a world, sorry, it's a vision instead of scarcity and conflict. It's a vision of abundance. A vision of a world filled with generosity and friendship. And I don't know about you, but that's the kind of world I want to live in, that I want to work toward building. A world where we all share one another. So, what can we do today? Speak and listen in solidarity. Give. Advocate. Pray and share, not just our resources, but our very lives and our very love and joy that animate our lives. So, today, as Christ breaks bread and we break bread in remembrance of Him, may the love that made us make us one. Amen.